This episode of the Modern Therapist Survival Guide is brought to you by the Therapy Reimagined Conference. What? October 18th and 19th in Universal City, California. Hang out with all of the cool modern therapists. Yes, we are sponsoring our own podcast because we are so excited about the conference. And if you listen at the end of the episode, we'll get you a promo code for a nice discount. You're listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, where therapists live, breathe, and practice as human beings. To support you as a whole person and a therapist, here are your hosts, Kurt Widhelm and Katie Vernoy. Welcome back, Modern Therapists. This is the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. I'm Kurt Widhelm. My co-host is Katie Vernoy, and a lot of times we jump around different topics here, and it's been a little while since we have come in and talked about some of the business aspects that go to looking at different ways that you can add to your practice, things that can challenge your marketing, challenge different ways that you can bring some income to your practice. And today we're joined by Marissa Lawton. She is here to help us kind of envision some different ways and how to broaden out your message and things that come along with that. So thank you very much for joining us. I'm so happy to be here. This is kind of like a mini dream come true. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're super excited to have you. And you and I I have had uh, several conversations about kind of how our our messages align. So I'm excited Mm -hmm. to introduce you to our audience. So tell us who you are and what you're putting out in the world. Yeah. So as Kurt mentioned, my name is Marissa. Um, I am a licensed counselor, member of the American Counseling Association, National Board Certified Counselor, those things. But I also have another side to me that is different than like the typical clinical experience. And I have a really extensive corporate business background in both the finance side and the uh, advertising side of some, I've worked for some more multinational corporations and stuff like that. So just in that nature, when I was in grad school uh, and everybody was, oh, my undergrad was sociology, my undergrad was psychology, I was like, corporate finance. <laughs> so I kind of stuck <laughs> out like a sore thumb. But I have found a way to really marry and integrate those two backgrounds. And that is the way that I help therapists who are in private practice look at the fact that they are entrepreneurs and how they're building businesses in their practices, but also what could be income beyond that and what could be different revenue streams. So that's my whole spiel. <laughs> you were in a job that paid money, and then you went into a profession that has way less money. Yeah. Why? why? <laughs> yes, very good question. Okay, so a little piece of that puzzle also is that um, my husband is active duty in the army, and so, and I'm, you know, gonna date myself, I guess. Not that I'm that old, but um, so when I started undergrad. It was the height of the economy in the early 2000s. And our professors were saying, by the time you graduate, you're going to be making multiple six figures, these types of things. But what's interesting is my junior year as a corporate finance major, uh, corporate finance died. (laughs) You know, like Lehman Brothers and these banks that I was supposed to be interviewing with in just a couple of months didn't exist anymore. Like it wasn't like they went out of business. It was like they full on didn't exist. And most of us know and still sometimes feel the ramifications of that economic crisis. So that happened. And then my husband got orders to the middle of nowhere, Alaska. So I moved from Phoenix, the fifth biggest city in the country, to a bush community where even if I had wanted to work at an investment bank, there were none. <laughs> So wow. I call this, yeah, it was, I call this my quarter life crisis because everything that I had trained for, I'd done lots of internships in school, in undergrad, and then even my work experience after was some pretty intense sales training and some pretty intense marketing training. And it basically was useless where I lived. So it was a big period of reinvention. And then that is where I was just I actually read a book by Jack Canfield called The Success Principles. And one of the exercises he has you do is go back to the things you did when you were a child 
like you're you're trying to get in touch with your your really inner and innate strengths and skills. And I was always, even when I was young, the person people came to advice for what should I do with my boyfriend? What should I do with my mom? This happened with my sister, like even really young. And so exploring that kind of led me down the therapy path. So you're in Alaska Mm -hmm. and you're deciding that you want to be a therapist. Yeah. But now you're more in the online coaching space. So, so it sounds like there was another reinvention. (laughs) Yes, there was. Tell us about that too. Yeah. Okay. So the funny story is, Again, like in Alaska, I had very spotty cell service. And if I sat one way in like my tiny army housing, I could get internet. And so that's what I was doing. I was was, like (laughs) scrolling Facebook. And what I first found was an advertisement for IFC, the International Federation of Coaching. And I'm like, who in the world would want to take life coaching? Because back then this was not a thing like it is now. Who in the world would want to take life coaching from a, someone in their early 20s or their mid 20s at this point. Like mm-hmm. that's not a thing. I don't have enough life experience to be a life coach. <laughs> now I know 22 year old life coaches that are making a lot of money. So it's a thing now, but it sure wasn't then. So it's something that was kind of always on my radar, but I didn't realize it was a real profession like it's turning out to be now. Uh, and so that's where I went to therapy. But then Another like fast forward is my daughter was born with some health concerns and it was taking me away from my agency more often than I was actually there. I was getting called out. Um, Your daughter hasn't eaten in six hours, that kind of stuff. So what I did was I approached the birth center that had taught me all of my childbirth education, all of my breastfeeding education, and I'd take it prenatal yoga there. And I kind of marched in there with my baby and said, you need a mental health professional on staff. You don't have one. And so I was kind of fueled by like postpartum hormones, but also by (laughs) like, I have this massive, again, change in my lifestyle that I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm not at this point, not able to work a conventional job. And so I came on their staff and they had very, a holistic approach. So while I was doing some therapy, I also was kind of doing some in-person coaching stuff as well. And it just evolved. I realized there's something here. I can really make a difference with this. And so I thought, well, that's the natural progression is to do this on a, a larger scale. From there, I migrated over to therapists. So it's been a very zigzaggy path. It sounds like it. And it sounds like to me that there's this piece of identifying a need for yourself because of huge mm-hmm. life transition moving, because yeah. you've moved several times across mm-hmm. the country and kind of identifying kind of this, what's the need and what do I have to offer? It seems like that piece, that kind of continuous evolution, I think is, is super challenging. How do you keep doing it? (laughs) Oh my God. I think, so part of this, I think every entrepreneur has this ability to see some kind of gap or some si- some sort of thing that's missing. They might not have the know-how or the skills yet to fill that gap. Those are some of the things I help with. But I think that if you have a mind for this, you kind of have a mind for it. And I really think therapists out of multiple industries that I've now worked in, therapists have a beat on this more so than a lot of other people because they're sitting with people every day. And if they don't know what people need in their lives and what people are lacking, quote unquote, lacking or missing or feeling a void, who does, right? So Mm -hmm. that's, that's one thing that I think our industry actually has kind of an innate knack for this that we might not acknowledge right off the bat, but when you sit with it, you realize, wow, I, I'm intuitive about this. I can interpret some of this stuff better than others. For a lot of, especially earlier career therapists that are, Mm -hmm. that have these bigger ideas or that are picking up on these kinds of things, there's always that kind of self-doubt around, well, I don't have these qualifications. You brought up a little bit earlier about the 22-year-old coaches that are just out there killing it. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice do you have for those earlier career people that have these ideas and just kind of need that confidence boost? Yeah. Well, first of all, Besides like medical doctors, really, there's a few industries that are set up like ours, but really to go have to have an advanced degree, 
Then to have to do multiple thousands of hours on top. So you have the educational experience, then you have the practical experience. And then we all have CEU requirements that we have to continue to prove and improve our competency. I think just the nature of the way our profession is structured, that we have continued growth and continued chances to expand upon that quote unquote expertise. But I also see this as one thing in our field that can hold us back a little bit, especially when it comes to the way the economy and the market is changing today, is because there's still some of that, there's no therapeutic modality that is better than others, but there are still some that harken back to that blank slate kind of idea where we are just a a stoic kind of wall. And sometimes I feel like that can make us hesitant or even reticent to chase these big ideas because we're worried about misstepping or worried about crossing a boundary or even being unethical. So I think that especially as you're newer in the field, that could be something that you grapple with. Like, how do I still practice therapy in an ethical way and in a responsible way yet I have this calling and how can I talk about it um, and how can I explore it without, without worrying about violating something? I think that's important. I think that there's, you know, kind of building on the question that, that Kurt had, I think that even opening themselves to these big ideas or to filling a need or that kind of stuff can feel daunting and, And I really do. I agree with you, Kurt. I think it goes back to confidence. I think that there is some fear about, you know, breaching this, this kind of the ethical space or, or, you know, kind of misstepping and making mistakes. But I've, I mean, I've talked with new, even newly licensed therapists who feel so afraid of stepping out Mm -hmm. in any way or in trying something new. And it surprises me because of what you talked about. We have these advanced degrees that multiple thousands of hours of experience. And so how do you, I guess, how, how do you focus in on helping people build their confidence? Because I think there are these other things. And I think some of us have potentially that have the big ideas and are willing to share them have kind of tiptoed because of some of the ethical concerns or the Mm -hmm. old blank slate ideas. But I think there's some of us in our field that are just not confident. Yeah. I'm going to get a little philosophical, but I think it starts with know thyself. And this is where I help a lot of my clients and students is what is the calling on your heart or what is the, if you were to stand in Times Square on a, on a stage and you had to say something, what do you believe so strongly in that you would want to share with potentially thousands of people walking by? And I think when you're coming from the message that you feel that the world needs to hear, that If you don't share it, it can be a little bit of a disservice, right? So when you can tap into what is it that means so much to me and that I can share and I know can make an impact, then I think some of this confidence, not that it's necessarily fake it till you make it, but I think that that (laughs) that fuels a little bit of that confidence because you know that what you're saying is, is of merit and is important. I also wonder too if part of this is that just by the very nature of the way that our our profession is set up is that there's so much of the time that we spend not with our clients that is around other professionals who are at further points in their career. So there's constantly this looking at what we haven't attained yet. And we, we get into this self-talk of, well, once I do this, once I get this many years of experience, I'll be at this marker that the people that I look up to are at that, you know, Mm -hmm. there's, you know, lots of people that I come across with supervision and teaching who reach out to us because of our podcast that I find that the conversation is really, well, from our end, well, why don't you do this? And the answers are really around like, because I haven't done all of these other things that largely don't fit into kind of that linear structure or that are just unnecessary obstacles to get there. And I really like this idea that you're talking about of like, everybody does have a message and love this metaphor of, you know, the stage in, in New York city, because it is something where it does take that confidence to be able to step up and do that. And 
everybody has entered into this profession with something that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'd even take that a step further of what I, what I was mentioning a minute ago is that we're almost like the boots on the ground. We're talking with people every day and we're listening to what they feel. I mean, a client might say what they feel is wrong with their life, but I mean, we look at it through a different lens, but we're closer to this than I would even say medical doctors or, or family and friends sometimes. So if we can then identify what it is that maybe, maybe seven clients in the same week have had some kind of similar complaint or some kind of similar voice um, to their problems, we are one of the first people in their lives that can start to see this pattern. And I really think that that can inform that calling or that purpose or that meaning or that message just in the nature of the way that we're so connected to people. And we have, you know, these therapeutic relationships with people that frankly, I feel like connection is one of the things that's missing in people's lives. So we're one of those conductors or those catalysts that can really take this grassroots information that we're getting and we can then deliver it in a way that maybe maybe it's that advocacy piece that all of us are a little bit trained in right that we're hearing straight from the horse's mouth and we can then translate it to a bigger message and a bigger meaning and i think that if we were to take it kind of in the business facet i mean we're constantly you know if we have groups we actually are listening to a whole focus group of mm-hmm. our ideal clients. If yeah. we, you know, if we've got individual sessions, we're de- definitely getting ongoing feedback of, about the state of the world from the people who are sharing with us so deeply. And I think to me, I, I think I've seen it that way too. And I like the way you've framed it is that we were the boots on the ground. We can see this information and, and really use it. I think for me, the difficulty almost becomes which gap do I fill? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, I've listened to people complain about so many different pieces of their lives, whether it's landlords or, you know, it's so many different things. I, you know, I I heard like several of my clients recently complaining about landlords and the system when you're renting a a place and that kind of stuff. And I was like, Oh, I know exactly how to do this better. You know, granted my skill set is not to be a landlord. So I, I know that I'm not supposed to pursue that one. Right. But there's so many gaps. I mean, you basically from your own experience and from, from interacting said you need a mental health provider in your clinic, right? Like you need to have this here. And I'm sure there's been other things as you've gone along the way that said, this needs to happen and I'm the person to fill that gap. But I think for there's, there's the folks who are not confident to take that information right. and use it. But then there's the folks like the three of us who are like, Ooh, shiny. Here's something I could do. I've got an entrepreneurial spirit. Let me see what I can do here. And I think there's also on the other end of this spectrum, how do you determine which of these needs you fill or which of these things that you actually stand up and speak about? Yeah. Well, there's multiple types of entrepreneurs. There's four really, but I think two that kind of stand out to me of of what you're mentioning. There's the serial entrepreneur who Mm -hmm. is, is almost that innovator. They can see a, a gap and they can immediately say, I know how to fill this. The pros of that is they're fast actors fast. They act fast. They act (laughs) quickly and they can get something to market, quote unquote, very quickly. The downside of this sometimes is by the time their idea is off the ground, they've had two or three more. Yes. So the smart serial entrepreneur works very closely with somebody who's an integrator, where it's, I'm the idea person, you're the detail person. And then they can quickly move on to their next idea. On the flip side of this, and I feel like most therapists fit into this category, though there's some overlap, is the social entrepreneur. And they're called to start a business from a place of service, from a place of helping, from a place of making a difference in the world, in the environment, in society, whatever. The pro of that is the ripple effect of their business can be huge. The con of that is sometimes they're lacking a little bit of what that serial entrepreneur has, which is the quick start. And so they sit on these ideas or their, their neck, their entrepreneurial idea is to come up with like the next United Nations. And it's like, it's so (laughs) big and it's so overwhelming that it's like, what is even my first step or my next best step? 
I have no Um, idea what you're talking about. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right. So this is why I think surrounding, this is totally not necessarily the point of our talk, but surrounding yourself with like-minded entrepreneurs, but maybe some others who can spark some things in you, like a mastermind or or even just like a peer-led conversation type group where you have people who have the, the skill set that is the puzzle piece to yours and they can maybe spark some of that innovation while you're trying to change the world or whatever. I'm so curious about the other two types of entrepreneurs now. Oh yeah. Okay. So <laughs> there's a lifestyle entrepreneur, which is someone who is out there to build a business, but it's more in order to fulfill their lifestyle. So their number one goal is not necessarily revenue or growth. They're like, you know, if I make 100K a year for the rest of my life, but it's on my own terms, that's the kind of entrepreneur I want to be. So they're out there, not necessarily, they're working for themselves, but their goal is not to build some kind of conglomeration. It's to just support a lifestyle. And then the other fourth category is the achievement entrepreneur. These are the Steve Jobs, the Bill Gates. (laughs) These are the people that they're just like, they're also some visionary for sure. And, and some innovation, but their main goal is I want a multinational corporation that is the biggest business I can possibly build and I want to achieve. And so the achieving, the pro and con of that is the achiever sometimes gets the bad rap of stepping on the little guy or, mm-hmm. you know, not being very scrupulous. But the, the pro of them is, you know, think about Google or Apple, they employ millions of people. So we need all of these different types of entrepreneurs and we need, we need all of them in their own, you know, in, in, in one capacity or another to innovate, to, to grow companies that employ people, to change the world, or, you know, just to be happy providing their families with the lifestyle. And, and maybe that even has some social implications because as their family is nice and happy and healthy and taken care of, then that spreads, right? For sure. So, I don't think there's an, a, a hard line between these, but if you're thinking like, how would I even come up with an idea? I know I want to help people, but how do I come up with an idea? Maybe you're more in that social entrepreneur category. And I imagine the type of entrepreneur that you're coaching, that you're working with has a, a unique need that you help walk them through in, in being able to help them realize what their goals are, help them realize how to achieve those. We talked a little bit earlier about that confidence piece that's missing, but what are some other things that you really see coming up as far as how therapists get in their own way as far as not being able to launch some of these ideas? Mm -hmm. Well, the two, I, I think the main thing that I see, again, is so there's the the therapist who wants to maybe leave the field and pursue something else. Those are not necessarily the people that I work with. I like to take the both and approach of the people who either they're in private practice or maybe they're still agency or, you know, community mental health or whatever that is for them in their mental health, like whatever that capacity they're working in is, but maybe they want something else. So I'm much more of the both and, but I, I think what comes up is how do I do this ethically? That's really what I, my biggest barrier to helping people make, the, and it's not necessarily make the transition, but make the mindset shift, I think is a better way to think of it, is how do I ethically uphold everything as, as a therapist and then pursue something else. And the two biggest ethical dilemmas that I see come up are um, self-disclosure and dual relationships. Because in the nature of an online business, which is my specialty, you have to put yourself out there. And mm-hmm. I think, I think even if you're offline, the, com- the economy wants transparency. Now they want to know the ingredients that are in their food and in their products. They want to know if their diamonds are ethically mined or what the labor standards are for that company. And they want to know, you know, what the CEO is doing on his Saturday night. That's, it's just the nature. Transparency is king in this modern economy. And so what, where that's a struggle for us in our profession is how do I be transparent and be ethical? How do I market in a way that reveals a bit about who I am and why someone would want to purchase something from me? Yet I've been trained for years not to do that. And then the dual relationship. So what if I have an online course and a client buys it? What happens? 
or, mm-hmm. or what, how do I, mar- how do I distinguish if somebody is the client or a right fit for my coaching or whatever? So those are really the biggest barriers that I see. And then once people make the mindset shift and find ways that, that it is entirely ethical to be a therapist and effective helper and also have some business, then usually they're ready to rock and roll. What do you tell folks when they're worried about that dual relationship? Because that's something that I've grappled with and I've gotten different advice from different places. How do you, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I'm a counselor and I'm licensed in Arizona. So what I have done is I've spoken to the Arizona board and I, that's my, always my first line of recommendation is talk to your board about what their particular requirements are. And then I head to, you know, the ACA code of ethics, but, you know, check out your code of ethics for your profession as well. But here's my interpretation of this is that the consumer, like I just mentioned, is usually a savvy consumer. They're usually making doing a lot of research before they make a purchase. Even I just bought a rug on Amazon and I read probably 500 reviews, right? On this rug. What are people saying about this rug? So this is just the nature of the way people buy now. And if somebody is buying your product of their own volition through their own research and you have not required them to buy it, I don't see that as a dual relationship. Here's an example. In undergrad, I used to have professors that would write a textbook and then they would require that textbook as the reading material for the course, right? That is where I see this would be a problem. If you have written a book or if you have some kind of online course and you go to your therapy clients and you say, it is a prereq for you to purchase my book or the only way you are going to get maximum capacity out of our therapy or maximum effectiveness out of our therapy is to then read my book. That's a problem. That's a problem. That is abusing your power. That is a, a, the definition of you know, power dynamics. But if, if you have a resource page on your website and it lists several books and one happens to be yours and a client buys every book on that that web page and you have not even mentioned to the client that you even have a book, well, that's their purchasing decision. So that's my interpretation of it. I'm sure there's other people out there that have a different interpretation, but I really think it's the power dynamic and if there's a requirement kind of thing. And then the other thing I always say is if you had a client and they bought your book and they came to session the next week and said, hey, I bought your book, how would you handle that in session? How would you process that? <laughs> would you have some kind of script prepared for something like that? Or what's the boundary there? So those are the kinds of things that I explore, you know, with my students. I'm really glad that you bring up about walking this ethical and legal line, because I think that that is so consistent with what we talk about across a number of our episodes here. And to really be mindful of the trust that's put into us as professionals and kind of the legacy that's left down by the people who've guided our profession for a very long time, but also bringing that into the 21st century and really looking at the difference of savvy, aware consumers versus kind of the warning cases that are often brought up by ethics boards of, you know, you're, Mm -hmm. you're fully taking advantage of these clients. So I'm really glad that you are coming from this space. And I'm wondering if you see examples of how this is potentially not handled as well in probably not your clients, but of the <laughs> the other professionals who aren't doing this quite so, so thoughtfully. Yeah, I think, so the first thing that comes to mind is like, if you work in like an IOP or like even an inpatient kind of situation, I, your your clients are inherently, you know, more maybe disenfranchised than a worried well type of client. So taking a look at the nature of the work that you do in a clinical capacity first, I think that is the very first question to ask. And then if you are going to market something, perhaps your ideal client for a product that's not therapy would be much different than your current clinical client. And then the other thing that I see is some people often will try and run these things from one website 
And I think that gets really messy. I think it's best to have two LLCs and two websites and just keep it all very black and white and very separate. And I think this is something that I've grappled with as well. And I think I really like what you're talking about. Part of it is just really marketing in a very different way. Mm-hmm. For me, that's become more and more complex because I'm doing therapy with, you know, that's career focused and and helps. And I even have some therapists in my practice. I'm doing this podcast. I've got this conference, like I've got, and I've got consulting that I do for mm-hmm. people on their careers. And so as I've done that, I, I do, I did end up with a, with a single landing page so people could find me. But I, but once you head out to either service, it is a very different website. Yeah. And I think, and I think being able to have that conversation is so important. And, and I think the biggest part is if you end up doing coaching or having a course or that kind of stuff that really aligns with the same target client, which obviously makes personal branding easier, right? Mm-hmm. Then it's really having that script, right? It's having that that that. How do you actually talk about? Do you want therapy or coaching? How do you have that that conversation? If you have therapy clients that potentially would benefit from your course or an event that you're running or those kinds of things, having that dual relationship conversation up front, really thinking about is this savvy consumer who decided to be my therapy client might they find my my other products and services? And do I have to worry about that? And if so, to have the clinical conversation first. Mm -hmm. And I think when therapists are venturing into coaching, this is where the line is the blurriest because often the delivery method of a clinical to a clinical client and a non-clinical client can look very similar. But I think if you're offering a product and by that, I mean a group coaching program or a course or a membership site, I think it's a little easier to keep them separate. That makes sense. Our guest today is Marissa Lawton. She's such a wealth of information and is actually going to be at our Therapy Reimagined 2019 conference in October out here in Universal City, the neighborhood of Los Angeles. Marissa, where can people find out more information about you? Yeah, if you guys like listening to podcasts, I have one as well. It is much more on this business focus, um, and it's geared toward those of you who are wanting to take maybe your first baby step beyond the couch and start thinking (laughs) about what this might look for you. And so that podcast is called Empathy Rising, and you can find it on any of your iTunes, your Stitcher, your Spotify, wherever you listen. My website is my name, marissalawton.com. You can find freebies there, like a roadmap that you need to, if you're thinking about online income that outlines a lot of steps. Um, And you can find my programs there too, if you would ever want to work with me. And we will include links to all of Marissa's stuff in our show notes. You can find those at mtsgpodcast.com. While you're there, check out all of the stuff about the Therapy Reimagined Conference. Come and join us there. If you can't, uh, come and join us in our Facebook group, the Modern Therapist Group, where you can add to all of the discussions that are going on over there. And until next time, I'm Kurt Widhelm with Katie Vernoy and Marissa Lawton. So just a reminder, we did sponsor this episode for you, because as Therapy Reimagined 2019 is approaching, we want to make sure that you can join us. And so we've given you a promo code MTSG50, all caps, MTSG50. Five zero, so that you can get $50 off your full conference admission. We'd love to have you there. Come join us out in the Los Angeles area for two days of CEs of all of the great content that we bring you on this podcast, but in person with some really cool people. We've been really fortunate to meet a lot of great speakers through this entire process, and we want to help you get all of your education. We have a great partnership with Simple Practice. They're providing CEs for wherever you may be in the U.S. and maybe even beyond. So come (laughs) hang out with us. Come learn with us. Come be a modern therapist with us. And once again, that's MTSG50 to get $50 off your full conference ticket. See you soon. Thank you for listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. Learn more about who we are and what we do at mtsgpodcast.com. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes.